Hi listeners and welcome to the latest footnote episode of the Fantasy Animation Podcast. I am a very hesitant Chris Holiday. I'm still Alex Sargent. Oh, he's done it. He's done it. Um, so I get the job of emceeing this uh, this short footnote episode, um, throwing Alex a, a term that has come up an awful lot, I think, um, in some of the discussions we've had on the on the kind of normal podcast, but also something that I know is key to Alex's own work and own scholarship in his book, um, Encountering the Impossible Still Available. Thank you um, for plugging it so I didn't have to. You're welcome. So this question of hesitation and specifically the fantastic. So yeah, Todor, yeah. you talk a lot about Todorov um, and I've spoken with you about um, his work on genre. I remember having a, a conversation with you about Todorov and genre that crystallized ultimately the direction of my PhD, mm. for which I'm very grateful. Um, so I'm interested in, in the fantastic as a term that is not fantasy but it's something very specific within a discourse of fantasy. Is this true? Sort of, sort of, but sort of not. Um, okay. There is, There are lots of different definitions of the fantastic. Should I start the 10 minutes, by the way? Are you gonna, are you, is this you going for well, it Let's now? go for it. Right. Okay, so, uh, and go. So the fantastic is basically a term that emerges out of the French vernacular, fantastique, um, and it describes all types of literature that have a supernatural, magical, impossible element. So the easiest way to think about that in the English language is sci-fi, horror, and fantasy. They are all part of this tradition of the fantastique okay. in French writing. And there is a lot of French literary criticism emerging in the mid-20th century that become very interested in this writing of the fantastique um, because of where it comes from, how it emerges, um, you know, it's often uh, you know quite low literary pr- prestige. It's often in ghost stories. It's open in folkloric examples, and it's they become very interested in this sort of wealth of literary tradition, which means that people can get very confused immediately because actually, fantastic can just mean a term that describes all kinds of filmmaking or yep. all kinds of stories that have a sort of impossible element to it the Todorov definition of the fantastic that you're referring to is something slightly more specific right so first of all we've got the fantastique yes. that is not specific to what we might understand as the genre of fantasy yeah. but it's something the French that... don't have really you don't or right. at least didn't have that currency that word that fantasy word in play so it was less easy to confuse the two but now it's quite easy to confuse the okay. two so... and some people use the word fantasy and actually what they mean by that is the fantastic in terms of a broader impulse towards the impossible right so it seems and when we've talked about fantasy before and the difference between genre and and impulse it would seem that the the fantastic is an impulse that could recur across different kinds of films or or texts right. um, and exactly and a really good um chapter by brian atterbury in strategies of fantasy talks about this idea that we can think of fantastic as a broader literary impulse and fantasy as a genre that codifies some of that impulse into a set of expectations and examples. So f- the fantastic takes place whenever anyone has any kind of story to tell that has an impossible element. Yes. But fantasy is what happens when an industry and a collection of writings become involved and people start thinking of it as a genre with tropes and narrative expectations and character archetypes and all this kind of thing. Okay, so the fantastic or the fantastic originates in a particular context and... Yes and traverses different kinds of quote-unquote generic boundaries or at least is a kind of impossibility that manifests in different um, cultural contexts. Now, where does Todorov and the fantastic So this is where things get really complicated. Uh, Todorov writes a book in 1974. Uh, 1974 is the English translation. I think it's 72 maybe for the French original potato patata called The Fantastic where he says the fantastic is actually a genre of writing that he identifies in a certain corpus of fil- of writings that emerged somewhere in the sort of late 17th century through to sort of the early 20th century. So the project 
Todorov is doing, and he says this very openly in his introduction, is to define a certain genre of writing, an historical genre of writing that emerged in a particular set of circumstances. And the way he defines this genre is a set of writings in which characters in the story experience something that within the context of the story asks the reader and the character who's experiencing it to go through a process of what he calls hesitation. Right. And what and a good an easy example of this is something like the Fall of the House of Usher, the Edgar Allan Poe story. So the Fall of the House of Usher is a story narrated from the protagonist's point of view. The protagonist tells the story of this haunted house with all these ghostly apparitions, and then as the story unfolds, it becomes increasingly difficult to, to work out whether this is a story about a haunted house or whether this is a story told by an unreliable narrator and it's actually about his own in, his own descent into madness okay and yep. so the reader is left in this hesitation between whether the story is quote unquote real as in the monsters really exist or what he calls uncanny which is the idea that they don't exist they're a delusion in the mind okay who was todorov todorov was a uh french bulgarian literary theorist right. he writes a lot about narrative structure yeah, yeah, if yeah. you're an a-level media studies student you've probably heard of him because he's came up with that damn equilibrium disequilibrium whatever it is Return to equilibrium. which all well, my equilibrium. undergrads want to try and crowbar into their essays because they still can remember it yeah. he came up with that thing he's a narrative theorist okay. and he's interested in these stories because of this idea of hesitation so the reason i'm interested in it and others have become interested in it is that yes what he's doing is setting out the terms for an historical genre but almost accidentally, what he ends up coming up with is a theory of how the reader responds to the fantastique yep. in literature that is really interesting and might actually start to unpack some kind of binary assumptions we have about believability and unbelievability in, in literature. That's how I use him and how others have used him. Okay, so if I understand it, your work is then taking the theory of the fantastic mm -hmm. and this idea of hesitation yeah. to talk about a spectatorial experience of fantasy. Yes. Not necessarily, because my sense from certainly the introduction to your book is that a lot of fantasy scholars are talking about what it is in terms of codes and conventions and how that doesn't always match up across different scholars. We yeah. have people talking of the genres, but you also have talking people talking about fantasy as an impulse. In, in the world of literature, basically, the way you respond to Todorov is one of two things. Either you go, okay, that's a very specific historical genre. That's not what I'm interested in writing about. Therefore, his theory of the fantastic doesn't really apply to what I'm talking about. I'm going to take a much broader definition, much more like what I was saying at the beginning of this episode. Or quite a lot of literary scholars have looked at Todorov's theory, have recognised within it a very interesting kind of reader response theory. Yep, yep. He talks about ideas of the uncanny, which links to sort of Freud, and Freud writes a lot about literature of the fantastic when he defines the uncanny. And basically there's been a lot of psychoanalytic fusion between Todorov's theory of the fantastic and kind of a more psychoanalytic, how do we distinguish between reality and fantasy in the human mind, and what kind of things are they engaging with it because actually Todorov does say in his book that the reason this genre stops is because of the birth of psychoanalysis because basically what this genre is is a way of readers interrogating the distinction between reality and fantasy mm -hmm. and when psychoanalysis comes along his argument is that th th this literature isn't needed anymore because people can just yeah. go for therapy instead right okay so psychoanal <laughs> psychoanalysis is doing the job of so yes so a lot of theorists the yeah. before me have picked up on these interesting links and gone hang on in in this theory there is a theory of reader response to the fantastic and it's not necessarily about whether the character experience it it's about these these stories tapping into some of the basic building blocks of our own psyche of how we make sense of reality mm. and asking us to interrogate them as we watch the story right so, well you read said, the story well so you said watch Freudian the slip there. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> uh, my only knowledge of Freud uh, is the is the is the posh or the proper word for Freudian slip, which is parapraxis. Love it. Which I often use to, to kind of talk about the, the the idea of interpretation of film more generally. That a film is somehow secreting something that it didn't mean to. Yeah. It's 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 engaging its own Freudian slip. Now you said watching, so presumably all of this can be applied, or your work is therefore mm -hmm. trying trying to 
take a theory of... I mean, you should write a book about this, but yeah. this idea of taking... The, I have, available in all good bookstores. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you, you did get the, the impossible. So yeah. you did get the plug-in after all. Um, <laughs> so we have a theory of the fantastic that is being plotted through its origins within the French context, mm-hmm. the way that Todorov is then co-opting it to talk about a specific genre of writing. Then we move into the psychoanalysis psychoanal- mm-hmm. uh, or psychoanalytic... Um, I suppose because you said about the 70s and obviously psychoanalytic yeah. film theory is around this sort of time Absolutely, as well, yeah. the Mulvies of this world. So how do we then take that and we talk about popular fantasy filmmaking? Well, so what you, what I guess what you need, I mean, I can't go into all of it, but basically what needs thinking through is if you, if you think about this as a prom, as a, as not as a, as a genre trope, but as something that happens, actually what Todorov's describing is is a fundamental way we live our lives. So the way we live our lives is constantly through a process of reality construction. We are obsessed with making things make sense. Yes. You know, it's, it's a lot of our neuroses, a lot of our anxieties, and a lot of our pleasures come out of when things make sense and making things make sense when they don't make sense. So if I walk out um, on the street now after we've recorded this and I see that my favourite coffee shop has been knocked down... I am confronting a moment of hesitation, right? My reality, as I thought it existed, has changed. I am encountering an event that until four seconds ago, I thought was quote unquote impossible because four seconds ago, I thought a coffee shop was there and now it's been knocked down. So I have to reinvent the rules of reality. And until I can reinvent the rules of reality, I'm in a moment of hesitation. OK, yes. In that small moment, even if it takes me a split second to go, oh, obviously they've knocked that down until I've come up with either a reason why reality is still OK, but the rules have changed or an acceptance that my p- capacity to understand reality is somehow a problem. So I could also go, oh, I'm in the, I'm on the wrong street. I thought I was here. I was actually somewhere yeah. else. My coffee shop does exist. It's just I'm looking at it wrong. I'm looking at the world wrong until I can come up with that rational argument. I'm in a moment of hesitation. And if you think about it that way, fantasy films can throw us into moments of hesitation as we are asked to look at things that are not, are not real. Okay, so you've got 30 seconds yeah. to tell us, beyond your book and, <laughs> the, and the work of Brian Atterbury, perhaps, yeah. or maybe he is one of the, the people what we should go to to well, talk about the fantastic, where are we going? Well, that is Brian Atterbury's Strategies of Fantasy has a really good introduction that talks about the definitions of the fantastic versus definitions of fantasy and clarifies okay. that distinction. Todor of the Fantastic is a really good book. Lucy Armit's Theorizing the Fantastic is a really good book that talks about the psychoanalytic kind of framework in which he's all talking about. Um, and then if you really want to kind of go up to date and modern, uh, Farrah Mendelssohn's uh, Rhetorics of Fantasy has a good chapter on liminal fantasy that talks a lot about hesitation in that. Okay, wonderful. So there we go. We've hit, well, you, you went a little, a little bit over, but I hesitated when oh, I started the, the um, timer. So I think okay. we're good. So there we go. Excellent work. Great. Uh, if listeners want to uh, send in a question or a keyword they want us to analyze on another footnote episode, remember the email address is fananimresearch, F A N A N I M research at gmail.com. Um, any suggestions there we will take and um, record some future footnotes about them. Um, but this has been us for another episode otherwise, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you.